Okay, level with me here. There's this idea that we live on a ball and it's spinning and traveling through space at unfathomable speeds, yet you can't measure it, you can't repeat it or observe it. At this point, it becomes a religion. What are you holding on to? Do you care what other people think? Are you just worried what your friends and family are gonna say? Is it your satellites? Is it your aliens? There are no satellites in the vacuum of space. Satellites are satellites. You're aliens. Let's say you're, you're an outer space alien fanatic. What if I told you you can have your aliens too? That, that they come from outer space, not upper space, but outer space. They are extraterrestrials. Terrestrial meaning terrain, meaning land. So what is it? What's stopping you? You've never seen curvature with your own eyes. You never felt the earth spinning. You never, you've never been able to observe and measure these claims. So at this point, it becomes a religion. Do you want to become free? What if there's thousands upon thousands of other continents? What if there is an actual creator? This place was designed for a purpose. This isn't an accident. Would your life change? We're all supposed to live in abundance. We're all supposed to be here for a purpose and learn and love and live. Being on a ball from an accident of a big bang, evolved from monkeys, that's no way to live. That's no way to perceive life. You're an accident, you have no purpose. What's stopping you? Look out here, there's no curvature. 120,000 feet, 30,000 feet, it's nowhere to be seen. Where's the curve? It's time to pay attention. It's time to wake up. It's time to become free. Seven, six. We have main engine start. Four, three, two, one, and lift off. Lift off of the 25th Space Shuttle mission and it has cleared the tower. On January 28, 1986, CNN watched the Challenger launch live on the air with its viewers. They and the other media outlets told you that the astronauts died in the explosion. But as always, there is an agenda behind every mainstream headline. This morning, it looked as though they were not going to be able to get off. One minute, 15 seconds. Velocity, 2,900 feet per second. Altitude, 9 nautical miles. Downrange distance, 7 nautical miles. Looks like a couple of the uh, solid rocket boosters uh, blew away from the side of the shuttle in an explosion. Flight controllers here looking very carefully at the situation. Obviously a major malfunction. We have a report from the flight dynamics officer that the vehicle has exploded. Today is a day for mourning and remembrance. Nancy and I are pained to the core by the tragedy of the shuttle challenge. We know we share this pain with all of the people of our country. This is truly a national loss. The seven NASA astronauts supposedly killed in the 1986 Challenger disaster did not die in the explosion and are quietly living out their lives in the US, with many of them hiding in plain sight, using their same names and working at high levels in the same fields they worked in before the disaster according to explosive evidence uncovered by investigators. We've located six out of seven of them. In the world of deception, it's really easy to say this person is that person, and there's a lot of that going on, um, muddying the waters. But six out of seven have identical names. They work for universities, most of them. There were no people in the Challenger. That was a hoax. That's been proven conclusively by researchers and reporters, investigators who have found that those supposed people that were in the Challenger are still alive today. We remember Dick Scobie, the commander who spoke the last words we heard from the Space Shuttle Challenger. We remember Michael Smith. We remember Judith Resnick. We remember Krista McAuliffe. We remember Ellison Onizuka. We remember Ronald McNair. People still think the Challenger exploded with these astronauts. It was a horrible thing. It never happened. Yes, the rocket exploded. There was no one on board. So imagine that you're at the launch of the Challenger. This is a historic moment, and it blows up in midair. Whether you are 
personally related to somebody on there or don't know anybody, you're gonna be a mess. This is an emotional, incredible scene. And CNN was reporting and they told the cameraman, let's get a live shot of Krista's parents. And when they zoomed in on them, they were giggling, they were laughing, they were smiling. I don't know how you can put a smile on someone's face, even if you told them the funniest joke in the world at that very moment. Just look at their face. Is that the face of somebody whose daughter just blew up in the most horrific, violent accident ever? Or is that somebody playing a role, not knowing that they're on camera and thinking about the money that they may have gotten? You can hide somebody that's allegedly dead right in plain sight. All you have to do is move them a little farther away, give them a different job, claim that they're somebody else. You don't even need to change their name. So statistically speaking, the odds that almost everyone on the Challenger have exact lookalikes with exact names still existing is kind of laughable, honestly. Exact doppelgangers existing in the world with the same names and when confronted, they get very nervous and they, their stories begin to conflict and they have the same mannerisms. You know, it doesn't take a lot to put it together, honestly. Let's start with former NASA astronaut Michael J. Smith with the same name as this retired professor from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Are you Michael Smith? Yeah. Professor at uh, university? Retired. Retired? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just stopped by because there's a room. Are you aware of that there's a rumor on the internet? It's that, not me. That people are saying? Yeah, it's not me, obviously. I mean, anybody that looks at my background, looks where I was born, it's not me. I mean, it's interesting that the uh, Michael J. Smith that was the astronaut looks something like me when we mm -hmm. were younger, but really not, if you really look at facial recognition. you never been a pilot, never been in the military? Nothing, nothing like that. Huh. No. Okay. Yeah. That's all and I, I just can... And I don't respond to the emails I get. I get probably an email, maybe two a month. Really? That, yeah, and I got one yeah. guy that's been uh, really hounding me, and I, I put, turned it over to the FBI. Okay, yeah, you just yeah. sure look a lot. It's the same I know, I know, the facial thing, but that's that's what we looked like, what, 40 years ago? Mm hmm Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Michael J. Smith, identical looks, uh, dimples the same, teeth the same. Uh, there's really no denying it. And before he could finish the question, Michael denied it. Oh, that's not me. That's not me, you know, and laughed off. What's he going to say? Oh, you got me? It's not going to happen. The driveway footage of Michael J. Smith, that's real. I mean, that that can't be a deep fake, you know? So at some point, you got to stop trusting a, a liars. We don't hide our space program. We don't keep secrets and cover things up. We do it all up front and in public. Next is former NASA astronaut Judith Resnick with an exact doppelganger working at Yale University. 37 years have passed and she hasn't even changed her name. Side by side, there's no denying it. When she's approached, she has a very odd way of not responding. Hey, uh, hey. Uh, Judy? Judy, how you doing? I, I'm, I'm from the press. I just had a quick question, if you don't mind. What press? I, I'm from a radio you. station in San Bernardino. I know there's a consp is... conspiracy about I'm sorry, the I'm space sorry. shuttle. No, I want to be polite. Um, I, 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 friendly, uh, just a question. So there's a lot of rumors about you being on that space shuttle. Obviously, you know, if you want to comment, we would really appreciate it. kind of odd that Judith is in full panic mode when realizing the press is in her presence. She's no stranger to being in the spotlight. She even made her way into Hollywood for a quick cameo. If the choice is to allow Americans to be taken as hostages or to be executed, I'll bring my own fucking rope. Saddam backed down and Ambassador Wilson helped thousands get safely home. When he himself came home to the United States, he was warmly greeted by our president, who took him to the Oval Office and introduced him to the War Cabinet as an American hero. Commander Dick Scobie had a company called Cows and Trees, and when you went to his website, 
there was an animation of a cow taking off like a rocket with a smoke stream coming out of its backside, doing a twisty curl in the air that looked remarkably just like what we saw with the Challenger. And after we started making videos on that and it started going viral, that website disappeared, never to be seen again. And nobody could have predicted back in 1986 that in 30 some odd years from then, that there would be something called the internet that would bring all this information to the tip of your fingers and you'd be able to search through pictures, Facebooks, websites, profiles. Now these people are scared. They're hiding their profiles. They're deleting their websites. They're making their Facebooks private. Anazuka and McNair are always together. They're hanging out at NASA and always talking about themselves. Ellison Onizuka, if you look at clips of him back in 1986 when this happened, he actually spoke like, uh, every other word was, uh. Let me say that uh, it's really a pleasure to be back. Uh, if you look at clips of his brother, Claude, now speaking, it's the same exact thing. Every other word is, uh. But uh, Allison's dream is continue to be carried on. Uh, I think we got some, uh, we're very fortunate that we, uh, uh, I think uh, we're ready to go fly. Thanks for uh, being out here today. His brother just so happens to be the spokesperson for the Challenger tragedy. Why aren't there any pictures of his brother back when this happened? Why didn't his brother speak at the funeral? Use your head. Former Governor Ariyoshi, who has a story about a picture that survived the Challenger disaster. Anderson uh, Honizuka came to see me one day and he wanted a family photo. And he wanted to take it up on a Challenger and he's going to bring it back, inscribe it, and autograph it. But that Challenger accident happened, and I felt very sorry to lose Elson. But I didn't even think about the photo. I thought everything else must have been destroyed completely. About two months later, Lon Onizuka called me and told me that they found in the water, that's a found, the uh, personal preference kit of uh, Elson Onizuka. And she said, there are two things in there. One was a monk, monk's uh, prayer, and the other was his family portrait. So I told her, oh, then it must be in terrible condition because the astronauts, uh, the, uh, the big bang up and the ocean in the water for two months. She told me, no, it's in perfect condition. And she said, I'm going to bring the picture over to you and give present it to you. And then in the meantime, NASA got the picture and they put this together for us. Ronald McNair conveniently has a twin brother named Carl McNair who looks exactly like him and is at a lot of the events now but was nowhere to be found when the explosion happened. Krista McAuliffe was a fairly new teacher just three years at that school to get her story planted. All of these people, the parents, the astronauts, everyone involved that you saw are a crisis actor. Crisis actor. As he was at the Cape in the stands to see Tuesday's launch, a sight that she says still haunts her. Why didn't I leave too? But I thought, no, I want to stay and see it. And as she read Mike's invitation for the launch, Miss Hesse said that she doesn't know if she'll be emotionally ready for a service like that in his hometown. Since I won't be able to see you all in person, let me say thanks for coming and have a great time. And I hope you see a good show. George Bush Sr. hand-selected the teacher, Krista McAuliffe. What are the odds that 30 years later, there is a professor at Syracuse University with the name Sharon McCullough? I still can't believe that I'm gonna actually be going into that shuttle. It just, it, it just really doesn't seem possible. Krista McCullough was asked if she had any fears about her space shuttle flight. People really feel that space travel is safe now. It, it's not that earlier feeling that, oh, it's going to blow up or something's going to happen. Right at this point, I feel that I'll be okay if I go off. Well, where's Jarvis? How come you haven't located him? And the answer is, you know, he could have died of natural causes, a heart attack car accident, you know, three, four, five years later, and it would never be reported. The reason they did it was a psychological operation to justify not doing manned space flights anymore and to pull on your heartstrings with an emotional cover. So if you dare question it, then you know you're immoral. And then when you look into it, you find out, of course, that you have all these people still existing in the world. So basically a uh, government version of witness protection for NASA. Our nation held a vigil by our television sets. In one cruel moment, our exhilaration turned to horror. 
We waited and watched. They were waiting and watching. When they saw the explosion, there was confusion. Was something wrong? The principal and teachers weren't certain either. Then it got very quiet as the horror of it began to register. Besides the trauma-based mind control and putting children through that, that trauma, and also it reinforces their model. It reinforces their religion. Look, all that this terrible thing happened. We're trying to go to space. We're trying, you know, trying to explore for science. But oh, look, all those people died. But at one o'clock, school was closed. It had to close. I felt as if uh, my whole body blew up inside when I saw that. And I can just never be as shocked as I am now. Seeing it with my own eyes, it really just scared me. Some astronauts blow up in a rocket. What does that do subconsciously to the average person? They don't want to go up into space. They don't want to blow up in a rocket. We'll leave that to the professionals. We'll leave that to, to NASA or government. But once they had seen the evidence on the visual screen that there would be no survivors, it suddenly became apparent to them that they were dealing with death. The government had incentivized the different public schools to play the challenger in their classroom. So they rolled their TV sets out, they had all the children sit down and get ready to watch it, and 20% of the American public watched the challenger event happen live. And within one hour, 80% of Americans had seen the challenger tragedy happen. So just like with 9-11, they have everyone see this traumatic event and then we're all in unison that we're traumatized. When it blew up, it was a form of uh, trauma-based mind control that you know some people will never grow out of. And then the emotions kick in and you're unable to think logically about what's going on. Of course this was planned. They made every school show this event live. They wanted these kids to grow up defending this tragedy. Think about how many field trips come here, unfortunately. Yeah. And they go in and watch that Heroes and Legends thing and they come out thinking that yeah. this is the greatest possible hero that they could ever be. And that's just... They're actors, <laughs> and we're building them up higher than your father, police, military, all these people that are actual heroes. These are actors working for a government agency, so. Next. Hello, Hi. I'm gonna get one of these signed if that's all right. My name's Justin. Yes. Yes, with an I-N. Where are you from, Orlando. Oh, okay. yeah. not far from Not too far. No, I'm okay on a picture, but thank you. I do have a question though. Sure. Sometimes when we're watching the uh, ISS footage, you'll see the uh, astronauts sometimes connected to like wires and harnesses. Is that to keep them like in the frame during the broadcast or what's the reason for that? You know, I haven't actually, you mean while they're inside the shuttle? Yeah, like when they're inside the ISS, sometimes during the feeds, the broadcast, you'll oh, see kind of yes, pulling on their belts or something I like that. that, 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 that is, I, yeah. I have not personally seen that, oh, really? but I know that they, you know, they try to be still when they're doing right. they're talking to someone, and then they usually try to release and do like a flip at the end Yeah, because like I've seen the yeah. flip before, and it almost looked like a foot was caught like inside something, but there was nothing really there. It was really strange. Uh -huh. I didn't know if there was something to kind of like hold them in place or something. We Next. never had anything like oh, that, okay. but they may have learned over time that it was hard to stay still and they may yeah. have come up with something. Did you, um, did you ever think the public Ready? would find out that all the spacewalks were filmed underwater? Thanks, sir. <laughs> <laughs> did you have any comment on that? Okay. Well, we train underwater. Oh, okay. Thanks, but only training? Only training. Okay. Most of the public have no idea that the ISS is located in an underwater neutral buoyancy lab in Houston, Texas. The space station footage that they trick us with is not traveling at 17,500 miles per hour above your head. It's all being filmed here on Earth. An exact ISS replica underwater. Coincidence? It's a pretty simple process. Film your footage underwater, remove the water layer, add in your CGI Earth layer, and cast your spell. Bubbles in space. The International Space Station, that's a complete fraud. It's a complete hoax. I don't believe that all these astronauts are living up there and doing all this. Every single time that they do some type of 
live demonstration, you can see some type of faulty wiring, some type of glitch. They're literally being held up by strings. Green screens, wires, um, CGI, uh, you know, augmented reality, all sorts of issues. Think about this. They always have the women with long flowing hair. That would never be allowed. They literally spray hairspray <laughs> in their hair to make it look like their hair is floating in zero gravity. The International Space Station brought to you by the same guys who faked six moon missions. Yeah, I believe that. You know, I don't know exactly how they're uh, videotaping themselves. They could be on one of those zero G planes and, um, you know, doing it all in there. I'm not sure how they're doing it, but I don't believe that at all. It looks like a bunch of green screen uh, fuckery. I don't, I don't believe that at all. The space station is a serious place. We're doing serious research, scientific research and engineering research. Running around in gorilla suits, going 17,500 miles an hour. There's supposedly micrometeorites, other satellites up there. They could die at any second, but they're running around playing with water. They're always playing with water, claiming to grow lettuce. And I love this video because it looks like animation, like something that somebody made, but it's actually real footage from the space shuttle, just sped up just a little bit. And this is a little video, it's about uh, four minutes long here. So there's the space station. I love that this is not animation. This is film taken by a shuttle of the space station. And so this is real, it's not animation. Now this looks like animation, and I'm very proud uh, to, to know that it's actually real film. It's not a video game. People are living there. I know this looks like animation, but it's actually really real. I love this uh, video because it looks like animation. It doesn't look real, but it is real. People can watch all these fuck-ups and trickery by NASA and all these other space agencies, and all that goes out the window because they see a little light in the sky and it's the ISS. Oh yeah, that's the ISS. That's all the proof they need and everything else goes out the window. The view will still be A-OK -okay out there and all you need to look for is a bright light in the sky that will be moving and that'll be the space station. I've seen the light go from horizon to horizon. There's many problems with that light. First, it's as bright as the sun. It's, a, it's really bright. How is the ISS reflecting that light as bright as the sun back to me the whole way across. Is it made of mirrors? Is that mirror following me? Right? How would somebody 10 miles away see the same reflection because it can't reflect in all directions? It's going 17,500 miles an hour for 12 minutes, I could see it. So what is it? I was in communication with a NASA whistleblower and he says that they have five B-2 bombers that they've remodified with, um, some parts of them are transparent material with a thin, you know, thin uh, metal struts that you really can't see. The bottom was overlaid with uh, LEDs to, ref to match the color of the sun. And they use them in their base. Two of them are in Alaska, and I forget where the other ones are. And they take turns doing these flybys. <clears throat> Good afternoon, commissioners. Today I'd like to bring to your attention a potential fraud on an enormous scale happening in your county. There's now clear evidence of NASA using numerous methods to grossly mislead the public about astronauts being on the International Space Station. During interior ISS scenes from NASA's own live feed, the use of wires, harnesses, green screens, and virtual reality have been detected to achieve the appearance of a weightless environment. This begs the obvious question. If they're really up there, why are they using Hollywood techniques to fake the footage? Are they in space or are they underwater? Now what's really interesting is that they train for spacewalks in an underwater pool with a complete ISS replica. Now surely they aren't filming these spacewalks in an underwater pool and then editing them to appear if they're in space. Because that sure would be something, wouldn't it? I'm calling on the Brevard County Commissioners to open a full investigation into NASA's fraudulent practices and use of taxpayer dollars. It costs NASA $3 billion per year to operate the ISS and if they don't have a darn good explanation as to why they're faking these videos, I and the public would like a darn good explanation as to where our tax money is going. It is our duty 
to expose and eliminate this fraudulent and astronomically wasteful ISS program. And look, I know what you're all thinking. NASA is part of the federal government and you're just county commissioners. Even if what I'm saying is true, what can you do? But let me remind you, not only is this happening in your county, as public officials, you have the platform and the ability to make a statement or hold a press conference, alerting the public, state, and federal authorities to investigate further. You have the power to start the conversation. I look forward to the day that $3 billion annual budget is put towards our veterans, our homeless, maybe some of that mental health stuff the young lady just spoke about, and the revitalization of Rivard County. Flat Earthers pay attention. We're paying attention to NASA. We're paying attention to SpaceX. Most people are, but yet they'll defend it. They'll defend it. They have no idea the Earth's supposed radius. They, don't know, they have no idea how far the sun is supposed to be according to NASA, 93 million, they don't know. They're like, how far is the sun? Like, I don't know, a couple million miles, I don't know. They have no idea, but they're defending it to the death. You know, once you start paying attention and have an open mind, pay attention. We do want to make sure that the Americans, uh, American people understand that uh, there's no need to panic. Uh, the president took this action, as I mentioned earlier, because uh, the objects were indeed flying at low, uh, lower elevation and they were in civilian airspace. And uh, we wanted to make sure that we protected uh, that airspace. But again, I, you know, we want to also make sure that the Amer Americans are not, uh, uh, do not panic during this time. Wait, what? It's on a balloon? Why is there a satellite on a balloon? It's always been that way. Flat Earthers have been talking about this for a long time. One thing that isn't really discussed in the mainstream is that uh, NASA, you know, of course we know spends more money on helium than anyone else in the world and actually just upped their most recent contract to hundreds of millions of dollars for helium. And they admittedly launched balloons bigger than one to two football fields. And it's significantly more efficient for transmission of data, for weather compilation of data. They basically have a fleet of balloons above you that are facilitating majority of the information that we utilize. So why do you think NASA is the world's largest consumer of helium? Why would they send up balloons, these satellites, on balloons if they're in magical floating space, in the magical floating vacuum of space? They're showing us, they're telling you right now, they're telling us in plain sight, Hey, look, satellites are on balloons. They're not in magical space. Right here at this research center. Okay. That's the loud, loud truck. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know they're going to make the... Okay. Uh... Howdy. How's 
doing some filming. What? I don't just see anything we can see. We're just doing a documentary on uh, the balloon launches and all the cool stuff. Yeah, we're independent journalists. Don't we film me? Don't we? Uh, well, I mean, we're a public. There's no expectation of privacy. Well, we we tried to call them. They said they weren't doing any tours. Yeah, they said they said we weren't doing any tours. Hey, of course, you got to do your due diligence and you know make sure there ain't nobody out there potting shit. Yeah, well, I get it. Like Johnson Space Center, they have armed guards. Yeah, they will shoot you. Yeah, they, yeah, they definitely, they operate. Play, do not run up in the air. Yeah, like nice. Oh, we're, we're just infatuated with the saddle hooks, you know? Yeah, just, not, we yeah. didn't even know they existed. It's cool that they're all going up on balloons. We didn't even know. We were taught, you know, they're just orbiting by themselves. Or they're yeah. shot up with rockets. Yeah, they're shot up with rockets. That's all it, it makes is. more they're sense like, on a balloon, so we're like, okay, well, this yeah, makes man, sense. Unless they got some top secret stuff, I don't know about it. <laughs> you don't know about any of these satellites without the balloons? The idea that you would need um, some type of box that free falls in orbit around a ball is really just a fiction of imagination. That we don't, we don't need that at all. We don't utilize that. Satellites have been on balloons since the 50s, and they've always been on balloons. They just lied about putting them in space. There's no evidence at all of satellites in space. They would have to have a propulsion system. Even if you believe that the Earth is a ball, you must also believe that satellites cannot propel themselves without a source to thrust, okay? We know that they don't have engines on them. What's making them go around? They don't make sense. Then you find out NASA owns 98% of the helium. Then you find out all these satellites that crash have balloons attached to them. Then you can deduce they actually float these satellites over balloons. It's that simple. If all these satellites are moving 17,500 miles an hour, some are moving this way, some are moving that way, it's common sense. There's 50,000 of them. They're supposed to hit each other eventually, but none of them hit each other. Come on, guys, wake up. There's no satellites. There's no proof of them. The only proof we have are things floating on balloons. Arthur C. Clarke in the 50s wrote a book theorizing about satellites falling around on Earth in an endless fall. Shortly after, we all of a sudden had satellites falling around the Earth. Now think about it. The Earth is spinning at 1,000 miles an hour. It's orbiting in an elliptical orbit, speeding up and slowing down at 66,000 miles an hour. It's chasing the sun in another curved orbit, and we somehow have geostationary satellites. That's a satellite that stays above the same plot of land. So it's mimicking the spin, it's mimicking the orbit, it's speeding up and slowing down and staying over that same plot of land, and it's just falling in an ever-ending fall. That makes absolutely no sense. And now it's openly accepted that they're on balloons, but they're making it seem like it's a new thing. And this is the new way we're gonna uh, launch satellites is on balloons and it's cheaper and it's just better. Like we don't need them space ones no more. You know, people are starting to figure it out. That's why they're, they're going back to balloons. And majority of all the transmissions we use for our cell phones or quote unquote satellite TV are all ground towers. They all send transmissions from the ground tower to tower, admittedly at high elevations. And of course we have underground and undersea cables that make up 99.9% .9 of all transmission. So this uh, just a facade in people's mind that you have little metal boxes flying around giving you all of your data. None of that is real. Oh my God, I'm calling my brother. That is freaking beautiful. Okay, there you have it, Artemis fly. Wow, it's flying right now. Whether it's the ISS or the rocket launch, the second someone sees it with their own eyes, they think it's real. This is freaking amazing. Oh, there it is. What the heck happened? They don't even know what the fuck's going on. The reason that you can always find a video of a rocket from NASA taking off and then slowly making a U-shaped arc is not because it's going around the ball and going to the other side or going out into space. It's because shortly after these rockets that are funded by your tax dollars take off, they only have a certain amount of time before they crash back to the earth because they run out of fuel. It's all made up. So what really happens is they launch them near the ocean in Texas or in Florida. They will never launch a rocket from the middle of the country. It won't make it to the ocean. It'll crash on dry land, okay? So NASA has to launch rockets from Texas and Florida because it's right by the water. 
If they wanted to launch a rocket from Little Rock, Arkansas, it wouldn't even make it to Texarkana. So when they launch rockets in Cape Canaveral, Florida, or in Houston, Houston, we have a problem. Yeah, the problem is you can't get past the firmament. In 1962, seven years before they faked the moon landing, Operation Dominic began. A series of 31 missiles were shot straight up into the sky to test how high humans can actually reach. They quickly figured out not far at all. It seems that whenever they were shooting these missiles up into the sky, they were actually interacting with different layers of this plasma field or this electromagnetic phenomena. And uh, it seems to have fluid-like properties as it actually hits a certain portion of this force field, if you will. It begins to disperse and seek equilibrium based on the impedance of the electromagnetic layers. Why is it when we review this footage that these things are exploding, it looks like they're hitting a barrier? Testing the strength of the firmament and they weren't able to penetrate it. What's, what's going on there? What is this? In my opinion, I think that they were trying to find a way to possibly get out. There's a firmament above us. So everything is as above, so below. Obviously, many people are becoming aware that there's a firmament above that many people are now starting to realize is impenetrable. No matter what you do, you can't go straight up in the air and keep going. An interesting uh, rocket launch was the amateur Go Fast rocket. They gave us something that NASA and SpaceX never gives us, an uninterrupted feed from their camera. If you watch a NASA launch or a SpaceX launch, there's four, five, six cuts before it even clears the launch pad. Gave us an uninterrupted 72 miles, I think, went up and all of a sudden it went kerplunk, it hit something. It went up and it appears to have hit the firmament. One thing I really want your generation to embrace is that the earth is a closed system. We cannot leave the earth. There's no place to go. There is water surrounding us in all directions, including directly above us. We now know that there's something called superfluid that exists. You could have helium-3, and it could actually offer full electromagnetic propagation perpetually without any impedance. Uh, based on the things that I see, such as Crow Triple Seven's lunar wave observations, I think that there is clearly a fluid-like medium above us. The waters above in ancient astronomy, which was the same science as astrology, except one was more theological and one was more secular. They taught that this was called the Crystalline Sea. And in the book of Revelation, it speaks about the Crystalline Sea. It's the ninth heaven. The waters above, it's firm. I think the evidence is pretty overwhelming that there is a fluid-like medium above us. What I can tell you for sure is the water above is level because all water find and maintains level. I feel that's the next wave of enlightenment is now more and more people realizing as above, so below. And the only way we can get above or below is to go within and tune our frequency to that of which surpasses and passes through. Who knows, maybe there is some kind of firmament, some kind of firmament, and there, we're underwater. We could, we could be underwater. Maybe there's water above the firmament and then water down here. That could possibly be why the sky is blue, because behind it is the firmament which holds back water. As above, so below. God's throne does not sit on a convex, silly snow globe, okay? The firmament, the waters above, where he separated the waters below from above, they're flat and level. It's the sky plane. The sky only appears to curve, just like the ground. There is no curvature in the sky. There's no curvature on the Earth. Well, Dave, the SpaceX Falcon 9 is going to launch from Vandenberg Air Force Base, and it's going to launch in just about a minute, maybe a little less here. Just see the trail it's leaving behind. Absolutely amazing. And to describe it to you, for, I mean, you can see it, but but from the ground, it almost looks as though... Some of these rockets look like they're scraping across a watery firmament. 
kind of like a boat dragging something through the water. You see what resembles a speedboat going through water. You'll see the rocket hit the firmament, explode like watery, and then it will skim along the surface of the firmament. Why is that? Well, because it's hydrogen, it's water. I'm not sure what they're doing, but they're not flying into space. It's almost like they're just throwing it in your face. Look, we're running into a solid barrier. These rockets literally look like they're bouncing off the ocean, like a boat in the ocean creating waves. Look at it. Look at the footage. Look at that. They're putting it in our face. It's soft disclosure. They can't just come out and say there's a firmament, we're on a flat earth or whatever else. They can't just come out and say it. They have to show breadcrumbs. They got to show a trail of breadcrumbs. They have to boil the frog slowly. People say, well, what's under the flat earth? Because they're thinking of a disc floating in space. We don't know what's under the flat earth because the deepest hole is 7.8 miles. And while they were digging that hole, while they were drilling that hole, they were using ground penetrating radar to see what they're gonna hit next. And they were wrong every step of the way. No more rocks, no more water. They hit rocks, they hit water, right? They were wrong, wrong, wrong. And then they hit an impenetrable barrier. They tried for years to get through and they couldn't. And then they gave up. But then somehow we have a meme that shows us a cross section of the earth, the next 4,000 miles, they know exactly what's there. They couldn't get the first 7.8 miles right, but they know the next 4,000. And everyone's seen the meme of the earth with the molten magnetic core, another thing that they're laughing at us because you can't have a molten magnet. Any magnet of any type, you heat it up and before it melts, it hits the Curie point and it loses all its magnetism. Have y'all heard about the recent claim from the heliocentric priests? They're saying that the core has stopped spinning and it's now spinning the opposite direction, which is gonna cause all this chaos. Well, this morning we are learning about a shift in the Earth's inner core that sounds like the plot, the Hollywood blockbuster. Scientists say our planet's solid core, which is actually disconnected from the rest of the Earth's layers, may actually have stopped rotating and could even reverse course. What does this mean? Well, at first it sounds like something from a Hollywood movie. Right. The script is, oh my God, the core of the Earth is spinning backwards. How do they know this? I, I just want to know, how do they know what the core is doing if they've only been down eight miles? How? How is that possible? We've only, as humans, dug down a maximum depth of eight miles. How do they know what's 3,000 miles down? Makes no sense. So if you look at a magnetic field on our ferrule cell, you have something called the inertial plane or the block domain wall. That would be where we reside. We live within a magnetic field. And you can only go so far down before you're actually gonna have the reciprocation of that energy or that magnetic field. We know the deepest hole ever dug is around 7.8 miles, which seemingly correlates to the deepest uh, area in the ocean, of course, the Mariana Trench. So the way that I see it is you're actually living on the inertial plane within the magnetic field, which actually then begins to make all celestial phenomena fit perfect within the toroid. And of course, this entire idea that there's this magic magma core made of nickel and iron that's spinning a different speed than the Earth spins is a complete fiction made up of seismic activity and speculation. And actually, when you look further into that, they say that that causes the magnetic field with something called convection currents. You have the geomagnetic field from the geodynamo model. And actually, you would have a symmetrical magnetic field coming from the core. As it is a sphere, you would have the same magnetic field in the north and the south. But what the evidence actually shows is that it is not symmetrical at on in the south the magnetic field gets up to 30 percent weaker there's something called the south atlantic anomaly which shows that it 100 percent is not some symmetrical dynamo effect causing the magnetic field if you actually look further into the dynamo model there's about 50 questions that have gone unanswered they can't even get the math to work with supercomputers it's pure speculation that they can't get to work and it seems that actually we are just prohibited from going too far down based on pressure mediation within a magnetic field there was a famous scientist that sent a submarine down and hit the bottom of the ocean and wasn't able to penetrate the bottom of the ocean as if there were some type of water barrier firmament. One of the strangest places on the ocean's floor was only just discovered in the 1990s. At nine degrees, one of a handful of people to ever see in person. Without a doubt, one of the most amazing I noticed there's something out in the distance, couldn't tell exactly what, but it looked like a dark band. And as we approach, 
approached this dark band of cane and donut. I saw this donut, it was black in the center. What the heck is that? And so as we get closer and closer to it, I noticed that the black band had what appeared to be kind of steam over it. And then I looked and there was water lapping against the shore. This band was a ring of muscles. And inside the ring of muscles was a lake. And it's like, wait a minute, I'm already underwater. We went out over the water in this lake and tried to descend it and bounced off. It was so super saline and dense that the submarine couldn't go down it. We literally bounced off. And as we bounced off, we sent ripples heading back to the shoreline. It's because the ferment, it's fun. What I believe is that this is a plane and everything vibrates. And ultimately we have to become masters of vibration to work through uh, the dimensions of this plane. Every This is the third dimensional plane. So that, this physical, 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 this is the physical plane. Now, if we close our eyes and we envision something, our brain doesn't know the difference between a thought and actual reality. So they teach us about gravity when we're young kids because when you're a young kid, you kind of believe everything that you hear. They tell us that gravity was discovered by a guy named Isaac Newton. And by the time he was 23, he had discovered gravity, invented calculus, and trigonometry. Well, I'm telling you right now, none of that happened. Gravity's just a theory and an excuse, really. Um, it's real simple. If there's a force strong enough to hold oceans to the planet, there's a force. We should all be stuck to the ground. You know, the force can hold buildings, skyscrapers, tanks, ships to it, but it can't hold a helium balloon. Helium balloon just flies away, smoke just flies away. Everything should be stuck to the ground like a magnet if there's a force holding oceans to it. It doesn't make any sense. Once you look at gravity and you try to prove that it's real, you'll discover there's no proof of it and that there is only proof of density, buoyancy, and electrostatics. Electrostatics is a proven thing. We all know that a positive and a negative will attract towards each other. So the earth has a neutral or negative charge. Everything above it has a positive charge and it is attracted to it. Everything that exists is electric. There's not one thing that exists in the entire world that is not electric. It's actually the unifying force that keeps everything here, holds everything together, and everything seeks equilibrium based on that. So everything's trying to find a state of rest based on its electric phenomena or its electric nature within the environment that we exist within. And then when you start to look further into it, you find out that on the smallest scale, electrostatics is significantly stronger than gravity is even claimed to be. Magnitude's greater, 10 to the 36 power to be specific. So everything, simply put, everything that exists is electric. Everything that is falling to the ground or not falling to the ground is seeking equilibrium based on electrostatics. We can actually test this. We can use something called a corona motor. And whenever we manipulate electrostatics, we can make things levitate. We can make things go up or down and we can actually change how fast they go down. We can also manipulate the weight of an object simply by manipulating electrostatics. And of course, that's how science actually works, is you do an experiment that shows you what the cause of the effect is, and you can manipulate electrostatics and cause the effect of downward acceleration, commonly referred to as gravity. Of course, I've never seen a test that manipulates space-time, and you will never see that, it doesn't exist. Everyone thinks that the reason things fall is because of gravity, but actually everything that exists is electrostatic. So whenever things go to the ground, they're seeking equilibrium. So they go find their balance on the ground where their charge disperses or spreads out in through the ground. So we have positive charge in the air. We have negative charge on the surface of the earth or on the ground, which is why it's called grounding. And then we introduced positive charge and then it went back down to the ground to seek equilibrium. This shows that that's actually what objects do when they fall to the ground. They go to the ground because of the electric forces and they seek equilibrium on the earth. We knew about it 
as in the 1950s, even earlier, and it's all been hidden because if humans were allowed uh, free energy, free movement, and able to explore, we would find out what this place is. We'd find out our position in this world. And that's the number one thing. Why, that's, why are they hiding flat earth? Why, what's the motive? And the motive is to keep us dumbed down, not knowing who we are, not knowing where we are, not knowing the true power that we have, and not having true freedom. So ultimately the master plan in all of this is to fake an alien invasion. I think one of the biggest upsets with globe believers when they hear flat earth is, we're taking away their Star Wars. We're taking away their aliens. We know aliens, extraterrestrials, have been documented since all recorded history. I've actually personally seen UFOs multiple times from like the age 18 up, probably seven different times I've seen UFOs. I know it's a very real phenomenon. What about the secret space program? I call it the secret propulsion program. They're using electrostatics and other technology to maneuver around. Maybe they're even just pulling energy out of the air. We can go back to, I think it was Reagan in his famous United Nations speech, talking about the world coming together, uh, facing a universal threat. Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. They knew back then that that's the, the best way, the most powerful way to get everyone to unite into a one world government. If suddenly there was a threat to this world from some other species from another planet outside in the universe, we'd forget all the little local differences that we have between our countries and we would find out once and for all that we really are all human beings here on this earth together. Well, I don't suppose we can wait for some alien race to come down and threaten us, but I think that between us, we can bring about that realization. We did secure some footage of the flying disc in the hangar. The code name for the project is Equipe, and it has been designed for humans to fly. We asked the scientist in charge of the project what propulsion system the craft uses, but he would not divulge what he called classified information. As to how much of it is man-made or something that maybe you wouldn't understand, that's a great question, who knows? But I think that they've simply reverse engineered ancient technology and then hid it from the masses so that we don't know what it is. And you can look back at the Germans and they, they explain that we're using electrogravitic propulsion. And so with electrogravitic propulsion, you could attain a perpetual flight. You could defy, quote unquote, defy physics. You could attain all kinds of changes in uh, angular momentum on a dime. Man-made technology that we don't understand yet. I don't know, maybe there's other humanoids or aliens, whatever you want to call them, like that way and that way, but up there, I don't believe it. UFOs are real. You guys are just confused where they come from. They don't come from some far off planet trillions of light years away. They come from the outer lands and possibly under the ocean. I personally believe that the government is so evil that they're devising any type of plan that they can to manipulate people into one world government. They call it the New World Order. One way that they can manipulate people is by destroying cities with missiles and lasers and all sorts of destructive bombs and then they can blame it on aliens. They can say that aliens are coming when really it's our own government. Now man has reverse engineered that so we do have them here now. We know our government has this technology. If they fake an alien invasion, they get the new world order which they want. They thought COVID lockdowns were bad. We found out that they pretty much lied to us about everything to push an agenda of more total control. We're closer than we've ever been to World War III, all of this other stuff. And now the only way for them to truly, in my mind, get what they want or supersede the timeline, speed up the timeline, is to fake an alien invasion. The moment they do that, everybody panics. The government has to step in as a one world government. All governments come together to fight an outer worldly threat. 
And then we're all in lockdown like you wouldn't believe because we gotta be aware of the alien viruses. I mean, we're already scared of the human viruses. Now we gotta be scared of the alien viruses and we're fucked. So that's, I think, the end game. And it's pretty easy to see that that's what they're gearing up for. That's why they're telling us there's a mothership in our... No, shut the fuck up. Like, we've had this technology for years. They've taken our focus and put it up there and not to the outer lands or the extraterrestrial area. When someone says extraterrestrial, what does that mean? It means extra terrain. So it's a lot more prevalent that the world is bigger than we know, in my opinion, than these beings are traveling millions of miles or light years away to come here. I believe they won't let us go past Antarctica. So if they won't let us pass, go past Antarctica, my favorite my favorite show in the world is Attack on Titan. I believe they're telling us things through shows, that being one of them, that there is potential for other land outside of what we know. If there's more land out there, then why are we paying $1,500 a month to live? Or California, people are paying three to $4,000 a month in rent to live. Why would we have to do that if all of our world could fit into Texas and then there was more land other places like obviously it makes more sense you can still have that concept that idea that belief whatever you want to call it you can still have that on flat earth you're not trapped in a snow globe I honestly do believe that the government is hiding more land there could be thousands of contents there's definitely more than seven I bet my life on it Relax, this is only a visual concept, although this is scientifically possible. They have advanced aircraft that can do incredible things and move incredible speeds, but it's for here. It's for exploring this world, not scientifically impossible outer space. Little green men running around, abducting people, that's the Hollywood mainstream narrative. There are underground caverns, there are underground cities, deep underground military bases, dumbs. There's all kinds of networks under the ground. Think about all the underground bases. Think about the millions and millions and billions of dollars that go into black budget projects and black, I mean, there's, that is a whole nother industry. NASA, nobody knows what NASA does. Regardless if it's, uh, you know, government hoax to instill fear and control and take away our rights, uh, if it's Pro Project Bluebeam, uh, just know that these crafts are not coming from upper outer space in the magical vacuum of floating balls. They're coming from outer space, not upper space. They're coming from outer space. The extraterrestrials are coming from outer space. So just know they're not coming from up there. There's a firmament. They're showing you on the daily rockets bouncing off of it like water. They're showing you on the daily. They're not coming from up there. They're coming from out there. So I've recently come across information from someone inside the military that as early as 1992, they were able to attain uh, the ability to do holography or holograms with acoustic holograms, electromagnetic manipulation, just utilizing light, as you know, um, for very realistic holograms in any size or proportion that you can imagine with an entire spectrum of dimensions. So I would just encourage anyone that does begin to see this activity in the sky to always keep in mind that it could be simple hologram technology used to manipulate you emotionally to get you to be in a state of fear. Of course, we've been warning people about that for over seven, eight years that uh, Blue Beam was, was given to us as a warning via uh, the Secretary of Von Braun that that will be their last card. He would repeat to me over and over, and the last card, the last card, the last card would be the extraterrestrial threat. Well, at the time, I kind of laughed when he said asteroids, and when he said extraterrestrials, I knew I wasn't going to deal with that subject. And now we hear on the news just today, this week, that they've slid in another enemy. Only this time we're going to protect our satellites. In other words, we have to have some reason to spend these trillions to waste these dollars on a space-based weapon system, and they're all lies. A lie. A spin. And Werner von Braun was trying to hint that to me back in the early 70s and right up until the moment when he died in 1977. What he told me was is that there's an accelerated effort in place. He didn't mention a timeline, but he said that it was going to be speeding up faster than anybody could possibly imagine and that the last card that was being held 
was the extraterrestrial enemy card. The intensity with which he said that made me realize that he knew something that he was too afraid to mention. He was too afraid to talk about it. He would not tell me the details. I'm not sure that I would have absorbed them if he had told me the details or even believed him in 1974. But there was no question that that man knew and had a need to know, I found out. The look in his eyes made it clear to me that he knew that there was something going on that was a big secret that he could not divulge. That'll probably be their last, their last card. I think that's where they're heading. They've got the technology, they've got amazing advanced stuff which they've held from us, the elite families for millennia. And also, there's patents for this, guys. There's patents, uh, old documents, patents, U.S. government, Russia government, German government, everyone. They have patents, documents from dating back to the early 1900s of building these machines by hand. Why are they building these machines? For what? What, what, what is the whole plan? If, if these are some special things coming from above, then why does man have to build them here to scare you with them? Why does man have to create blue beam technology to, coming soon, scare you with this stuff? Because none of it's coming from above you. None of it is random, okay? It's either coming from the outer lands, under the ocean, or they're man-made, or blue beam, or all the combination of what I just said. But there's nothing coming from above your head, so please stop. Stop holding on to your alien bullshit. Let your ball go. My name is Joseph Spencer. I was known as a man in black. Following seven years acting as a counterintelligence agent for the CIA, I was recruited for a new assignment that entailed working within above top secret operations. I was aware of the black budget projects, but never knew the context of them due to their high level of secrecy. Even the president was denied access to their inner workings. Annually, billions of dollars are poured into black projects, which operate without any supervision or intrusion. They have full autonomy. The operations deal primarily with advancing military technologies, most of which have been reverse engineered from recovered alien spacecrafts that had either crashed or were shot down by our military. The public, sadly, will never, ever have knowledge of these operations. Since the early 1950s, scientists have been developing holographic technology and over the years improved it to a state that we can only imagine. As I stood there staring at the bomber, which looked so absolutely real and solid that I could reach up and touch it, I contemplated the possibilities. What if this projection was a thousand feet up in the sky? How would anyone know that that was an illusion? The Phoenix Lights craft, witnessed by 10,000 people, was the first grand scale sky beam test upon the public. It succeeded beyond expectations. In October 1938, Orson Welles unleashed his War of the Worlds radio broadcast to the American public. Where so realistically portrayed, vast portions of the population went into panic. Terrified citizens scrambled to evacuate their cities in droves. America had been easily tricked by very simple means. In the year 2024, the world will stand witness to a massive alien invasion. Thousands of projected holographic alien warships will blanket the skies, sending people into a panic. Real military crafts within the holograms will inflict actual damage to the surrounding areas to sell the gimmick. And as a result of the ensuing human chaos, a one world government will immediately form without any resistance from the people. They will be the new world order. Once this happens, we as a people will be doomed to enslavement and accelerated depopulation. With that said, the only hope for human salvation is to acquire and spread the knowledge of these activities and agendas. Resist, retaliate, then conquer this imposing enemy. The time is now. The time is now. The time is now.
would rich, powerful people want you to not know the Creator, God? Because a man of God cannot be controlled. 